Good morning. And a warm welcome to you to St. Matthew's United Church as we continue this season of spring, the season of resurrection and new life. I discovered on the way here as I was driving by the Halifax Common that today is the celebration of Aid. So Aid Mubarak to all who celebrate and Happy Father's Day to all who celebrate. This is the season of resurrection, the season of new life, the season of springtime. We are in community bound together by love and peace. And I'm very glad to be able to welcome you here this day, not only those of you who are here in person, but also those who are joining us in spirit via our live stream. We do have a few announcements uh, this week upcoming, next Sunday morning after church, we will have a congregational meeting. It's a, kind of an abbreviated annual meeting. We will look at the budget for the upcoming year and we'll also hear updates on both the Legacy Project through Kindred Works and One United Church, the conversations with St. Andrews and Fort Massey. There's one other announcement, and that is that today is the birthday of Jolene Pattison in our choir. And so we are uh, invited, and it has been approved by Jolene, to sing Happy Birthday. We are bound together in community by ties of peace and friendship on this land we share with the Mi'kmaq Nation in peace and friendship. And so I invite you as we begin our service this day to turn to one another and greet one another with signs of peace and friendship. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to join with me in the words of our opening prayer, in the words printed in italics. Let us pray. Gather us in, loving God. Let us lay down our burdens. Let us set aside our worries. Let us open our spirits to your spirit. Gather us into your peace, O God. Ground us in gratitude. Speak to us of hope. Lift us with your wisdom. Gather us in community, we pray. Teach us to live gently. Help us to live courageously. Make us unafraid. Abide with us, O oh God, and hold us fast. May we live with love with peace and friendship, and with trust in you. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is at 646 in Voices United. Siahamba is a South African Zulu hymn. There are three verses in English. Verse three, we will sing the original in the Zulu, and there are pronunciation. There's a little pronunciation key on the slide. The lyrics are on the slides. Um, do, do give the Zulu a go. 
We've been singing this for a long time, and you may find that it falls right into place for you. We are marching in the light of God. Please be seated. The reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Mark from the fourth chapter and beginning at verse 26. Jesus has been teaching his disciples about the kingdom, using parables, stories that reveal a deeper meaning. Listen as he continues his teaching. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What makes a weed a weed? I was invited to contemplate this question on an outdoor visit this past week with a member of the congregation, assessing the future of some of the things growing around in their garden. What makes a weed a weed? The easiest answer, of course, is that a weed is something that we don't want where it is whether for aesthetic reasons or because it's using up soil nutrients that we'd very much prefer were aimed at our peas or our carrots or our rhododendrons. We don't want it where it is, and therefore it is a weed. But that's really just about location, isn't it? It doesn't really speak to there being a quality of existential weedness. And beauty, or lack thereof, is obviously also not the key. Lilies of the valley are considered by many to be weeds, and so are violets and forget-me-nots, and they're all patently beautiful. And utility, or lack thereof, isn't even the key. We've come to a better appreciation of the crucial utility of dandelions for the bees, for example, and the utility of maple trees, as another example, is definitely well established, despite the fact that if my backyard an inch thick in maple keys is any indication, maples have definite weedy tendencies. So the quality of weedness, it's not a lack of usefulness, it certainly isn't a lack of beauty, and it certainly isn't simply contingent on not being where we want it to be. What horticultural scholars all seem to agree on is that what makes a weed a weed is that it can't be controlled. It's been built on purpose to defy our authority and mess with our plans and keep popping up regardless of what we do. As one scholar I consulted put it, the only defense against goutweed in your yard is to move. <laughs> and I can attest to that being true. My backyard neighbors planted goutweed as a ground cover, and I'm here to tell you, it is covering the ground in the west end of Halifax. A weed is a plant that cannot be controlled. So say the horticultural scholars and the biblical scholars agree particularly when they look at the passage in Mark's gospel that we just heard from Deneen, and they chuckle a bit at Jesus' very clever pairing of these two parables about seeds taking root and growing. The parable of the farmer and the parable of the mustard seed. Because Jesus does pair them up. They were clearly first heard together and then were remembered and written down together. They are meant to be heard as a pair. Two parables about the kingdom of God, about the way the world is in God's envisioning, and paired up on purpose to stretch the disciples' understanding based on what Jesus knows they already know by surprising them a bit shaking up their preconceptions the way parables are meant to do, dropping the first parable about the farmer on them, and yeah, 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 he plants, things grow, it's a mystery, it's time for the harvest, he reaps the benefits of his work, but then following it up with the second parable about the mustard seed, which if for us it calls to mind at best just illustrations in a Sunday school Bible of a lovely shrub and all the birds of the air have come and make nests in its branches. For the disciples, what it calls to mind is pretty much goutweed. Because mustard seed may be tiny, and it is, but it's also relentless. 
Mustard goes everywhere. It takes root everywhere. It spreads everywhere. And it can't be controlled. Nobody needs as much mustard plant as there ever is. It's relentless. In the context in which Jesus is teaching, it can grow 20 to even 40 feet tall in no time. It is the worst weed in that context. It can't be controlled. And that, says Jesus to the disciples, is what the kingdom of God is like. It's relentless. It'll spread and keep spreading and keep spreading. It'll feed and shelter. All the birds of the air will come and make nests in its branches. It's glorious, and it can't be controlled. You can't control it. And we get it. We get the metaphor. Just as the disciples do, we get it. God's love is relentless, and it's not something that we can control. It's not something we get to say is for this one and not for that one. It's just poured out, out of our control to uphold all of us and our well-being. The disciples get it, and we get it. And good, says Jesus. Now go back and think again about that farmer who's put in the hours and dug up the field and laid out the rows and fertilized the soil and carefully planned it all out and planted the seeds in hope and anticipation. Because the truth of the matter is that even that, all of it, to some degree, is ultimately beyond that farmer's control, beyond our control. Not that we don't play a role, because of course we do. And not that we don't have an impact, because of course we do. But in terms of what rises up and whether we, m what we metaphorically plant so carefully takes or doesn't take or gets overwhelmed, there is a point in our efforts to be the ones in charge of this whole endeavor we call life where wisdom and grace might dictate a recognition that our capacity for control is limited. That all our best hopes are wonderful. That our the theoretical constructs are things of great beauty. That our efforts have been mighty and worthy and strong, but ultimately, there's a point past which we really don't have control. Just think about that farmer. It all looks so orderly. But the disciples must surely know, and with far more gut-level anxiety than any of us would ever feel, since after all, if things don't work out for us in our gardens, we can always just go to the grocery store. The disciples must surely know that once the seeds are sown, once the hopes have been declared, once what can be done has been done, then there is a certain letting go that the farmer needs to accept, that we need to accept. We can nurture, we can fuss, we can hunt down slugs and try to keep the deer away, we can hope for rain, but not too much. But we're not in control of all the things when it comes to what will eventually take root and thrive. Or indeed, what else will stand down and leave enough room for the thriving? And if that's hard to accept sometimes, well, that's the way it is. That's reality. There's mystery in the mix. There's God in all God's mysterious, unfathomable, uncontrollable spirit in the mix. There's creation in all its complexity in the mix. The goodness that grows can surprise us even when we did plant the seeds on purpose. And the abundance of the growth, even its sheer power to take over the joint, can amaze us. 
but the seeds were all there. Planned and planted, or just landed. If some of them only God recognized in them their astonishing potential, well, that's what God does. Indeed, if only God recognized them in them their worth or anything positive of all, well, that's what God does too. Two parables. In the first, seeds of grain sown on purpose in hope. And in the second, what amounts to a weed, mustard seed, mustard plant, popping up, perhaps in defiance of the gardener's hope, or at least really not part of his plan. And listen, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. It will take what you plant on purpose, and it will take what's already there. It will use what you want, and it will use what you're trying to beat back. It will rise above all your best hopes, yielding 30, 60, 100 fold. And it will cast its eye over that weed infestation that no one would ever choose, and we certainly didn't, but love is love, and God wants for us what is good, so God will use that too like a huge shrub of mustard weed, where all the birds of the earth make their nests in its branches. The pairing of these two parables in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus didn't do it by accident. What he wants the disciples to grasp, what he wants us to grasp, is not just the limit of our own capacity to control what grows, what seeds in ourself take root and flourish, where the weeds land and what they get up to. It's also how unlimited God's capacity is to bring forth goodness and well-being and connection and purpose out of whatever seeds there are, whatever's landed, whether carefully planted or blown by the wind. And no, that is very much not God sent me this thing so I would learn from it. It's this thing happened, and this is what God did with it. Jesus uses the metaphor of seeds and planting with intent because some things happen on purpose and some things just happen. A rock dropped in a pond and the ripples go out. A stream heads down a mountainside and meets 101 obstacles on the way. The waves come into the shore, intending just to brush up against the beach and hit a rock and crash. It may be that tidy fields of grain is what we've planned for and what we've hoped for, And we get to plant and hope. It may well be that instead it feels like everything we've called a weed and been trying to beat back seems to be multiplying at an overwhelming rate until we're hardly sure there's going to be a field of grain even left pretty soon. But listen, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. It will use what you plant It will use what you didn't choose and never wanted. It will rise above all your best hopes, and it will pour out its love over that nothing you ever wanted to make it bearable or maybe even good, where all the birds of the earth build nests and lay their eggs and new birds get born, and when the long night is over, the dawn breaks and you wake up and they're singing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join me in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness? You'll find it in Voices United at 288, but the lyrics will be on the screen.
Amen. Please be seated. Let us bring before God our prayers this day. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for your presence in our lives, for showing us signs of hope and moments of beauty, for giving us strength for this day. You challenge us, O God, with your vision for the world and for us. You challenge us to make a difference, to trust in your goodness, to act, to be courageous, to pray. And so we pray that all might be fed, that all might live in safety. You challenge us to keep our eyes open when it's easier to turn away. And so we pray that none might be forgotten, ignored, avoided. We pray for refugees who are far from home, for those who are fleeing war and bombardment and famine for those who are not able to flee, who are contending with despair. We pray, O oh God, for all who are consumed by mental illness and for their families, by all who are afraid of the future. We pray, O oh God, for restoration for healing, for peace. God, in the beauty of these spring days, we pray for those who are confined in hospital, who are ill at home. We ask, O oh God, for wisdom, for kindness, and for patience in dealing with those around us. We ask for courage to speak up against hurt and brokenness. We pray for strength when we are hurting, for the goodness of your love to bring new life into our sore places. Trusting in you, O oh God, we bring before you all those for whom we're especially concerned this day. As the school year draws to an end, as the busyness of convocation season reaches its peak, as so many turn to a time of change and shift, and wondering what will come next. We pray, O oh God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, for your people and for ourselves. And in the words that he used with his disciples, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I mentioned earlier that my neighbors behind me had planted gout weed a few years back as a ground cover. It is now the ground cover of my entire neighborhood, and that is despite the fact that all our tiny little yards are thoroughly fenced up, and sometimes even walled. But some things defy walls. 
And one of those things is the love of God. Will you join me in singing Though Ancient Walls, which is number 691 in Voices United, but the lyrics will be on the screen. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 5. Now let us go out into the beauty of this day to do justice and to love kindness and to travel humbly together in God's path. And let us go out knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rests above us and carry us this day and always. Amen.